Welcome to Cold War Liberals, who are going to be looking at, and last but not least, Isaiah Berlin, the Jewish-British political philosopher who served in wartime, uh, in the wartime of the United States, uh, who uh, became one of the chief creators of the idea of the West, so to speak, what the West stood for in contradistinction to the ideas of fascism and the ideas of Soviet communism. Uh, uh, Isaiah, Isaiah Berlin was born in Riga, Latvia, 1909, uh, to a family of uh, a Jewish uh, timber merchants. His father was a timber merchant, a very prosperous one. And uh, they, he literally was involved in the Bolshevik re revolution as a small child in uh, 1917. Uh, and he and his family uh, escaped the revolution and came and settled in England. Now, Berlin is, uh, was a very interesting figure. Um, he uh, he uh, studied at... Uh, he, he, he learned English ex at an extraordinary rate very quickly uh, and began, uh, began entered Oxford, uh, reading politics, philosophy, philosophy in particular, uh, and became quite an important part as a, as a young scholar of the uh, Oxford, sco uh, Oxford scholars at the time who were in some ways reshaping uh, philosophy. Uh, he became a fellow of all souls. I, be I, I, I believe I'm right in saying he was the first Jewish uh, fellow of all souls, which you may or may not know is a uh, uh, kind of graduate institution. It's a research institution within the University of Oxford, which you can uh, enter in only one of two ways, basically, by uh, either winning a prize fellowship which was an exam you had to take, a written exam followed by an oral exam in his day in, in, in at least two different languages. You weren't allowed to speak English, you had to speak German, and I think he spoke Russian, I can't remember, in his exam. Uh, and, uh, or else by invitation. And uh, to this day, a great many of Britain's elite, so to speak, establishment, uh, particularly in finance, journalism, and so on, were actually members of this particular college. It has a fantastic library, the Codrington Library. It's absolutely wonderful library. Uh, so he was this young scholar. You can see him here on the left, looking very serious, very committed. Uh, and his first work... Uh, was actually a biography of Marx. He was never a Marxist, but he became extremely interested in Marxism. It was the 1930s by then. Everybody was very interested in Marxism. Uh, and he wrote one of the first and most enduring uh, biographies of, uh, not so much biographies, critical biographies, looking at Marx's ideas in the context of Marx's life. And it's still in print to this day. Um, during the war, what did he do during the war? Well, he ended up after a, lo it, a long series of misadventures, which if you read the wonderful uh, biography by Michael Ignatieff, which is also short, rare thing nowadays with biographies, only 300 pages, but very, very well worth reading. Uh, he ended up doing war service in Washington, D.C., and in effect became the uh, uh, British intelligence, political intelligence man, in Washington, D.C. He had an enormous capacity, a great skill, I think. It's uh, for what we would today call networking. Uh, those days, the word didn't even exist, but he was a uh, sort of person who was completely at his uh, ease, talking to uh, labor unionists in New York, and at the same time, taking uh, society women out for dinner uh, with, the, with the Lord Halifax, the British ambassador. He had a tremendous capacity, I think, for this kind of uh, networking and he used his networks to immense effect and became uh, became the uh, Brit as I say uh, 
the person writing political intelligence. As Britain entered the war, America entered the war December 1941, knowing about what the Americans were thinking was vital. And Isaiah Berlin became Britain's man on the ground in Georgetown, keeping his ear to the ground and uh, acting as uh, writing a political intelligence report on a weekly basis. They've actually been published, in fact. And the, uh, the, uh, these intelligence reports really circulated very widely. They became extremely well known within the British government to the extent that, uh, you know, both Churchill and Anthony Eden, the foreign secretary, were, were reading them every, every week. And, and, you know, there are some famous memos between them about who is this chap we have in Washington. He's doing a fantastic job. And this is a funny story, actually. Uh, to the extent that Churchill said at a certain point, as the war came to an end, that he would like to meet Mr. Berlin. So they organized a dinner party at uh, number 10 Downing Street, uh, in which Churchill was going to, among other people, meet Mr. Berlin, who had made such a big contribution to, to, to the war. Uh, so as the meal went on, Churchill sort of looked at him, you know, with a cigar. And, so what does my friend, the president, think is going to happen to Japan after the war? And uh, Mr. Berlin responded, you know, sir, I shall tell my grandchildren that Winston Churchill passed me that question. And uh, Churchill continued to say, and what does Mr. Berlin think uh, we, we will do for the reconstruction of Europe? And uh, Mr. Berlin said, you know, sir, I will really tell my grandchildren that uh, Mr. Berlin, uh, that Mr. Churchill asked me that question. And Churchill was offended. Why, why doesn't this man talk like he writes? Why doesn't he tell me all this, uh, uh, give me some insight as to what the president's thinking about what we should do with Japan and so forth? Well, at the end of the dinner, it became clear that the British Civil Service, in its infinite wisdom, had not invited Isaiah Berlin, but actually invited Irvin Berlin, the, uh, the, the songwriter. <laughs> this is actually a true story, right? Uh, <laughs> and this, of course, caused enormous amusement when it became public, public knowledge. But in any event, uh, Berlin um, and, he, and the photograph at the bottom there with the cigarette in his mouth shows what he was like about the time when he wrote political ideas in the 20th century. Berlin, uh, of course, as a result of the war service at the heart of uh, uh, DC, uh, really was that rarest of things, a public intellectual, uh, well, he wasn't at that point a public intellectual, but was certainly an intellectual, a well-known political philosopher, well-known philosopher, who uh, had access to the corridors of power. Uh, he was, uh, he served at the Potsdam Treaty uh, uh, as part of the British delegation uh, and the final text of the Potsdam Treaty, because of course he spoke fluent Russian, and the final text of the Potsdam Treaty, uh, he was one of the people who edited it. And uh, subsequently, before he went back to academic life, in fact, there was some idea of making him a British civil servant. Uh, he was paid to go to Russia, pay a visit and talk and discover about intellectual life in Russia. Uh, at the end of you know, 1945. So we're talking November, December 1945. Uh, immediately after the end of the Second World War, he really is one of the very first intellectuals to go back to the to, to Western intellectuals to go to the Soviet Union. And, and while he was there, I'm sorry if I'm giving you too much background information here, but it's actually quite interesting. You see where, while he was there, uh, he, uh, had a quite extraordinary visit. I mean, there's no doubt that the visit changed his life. Uh, he met Pasternak and subsequently uh, Berlin would be instrumental because of the connection he made with Pasternak in organizing the publication of uh, Dr. Shivago in, in the West. Uh, he uh, met some of his surviving relatives who, frankly, his entire family, as you can imagine, Latvian Jewish family, uh, his entire family had been killed either by the Nazis or by the Soviets. 
practically, but he met some of his surviving relatives. Uh, and he had a life-changing meeting with the poet, or poetess, Anna Akhmatova in, in, uh, in, in, uh, in, in Leningrad, which of course just, uh, you know, was just recovering from the terrible siege in which a million and a half people lost their, lost their lives. I mean, it was an enormously important event for him. And, and she too uh, had this extra, they had this extraordinary conversation. It lasted an entire night uh, in which they were talking about ideas and books. And uh, she was, you know, a leading figure in the Soviet literary intelligentsia. She was, that they were hoping at the time that, uh, post, that Stalinism after the war would not be as terrible as it had been before the war for intellectuals. Uh, and, and she uh, wrote a poem subsequently uh, in which uh, she, she wrote, and I quote, uh, he will not be a beloved husband to me, but what we accomplish, he and I, will disturb the 20th century. Now, she wasn't known for her modesty, but uh, there's some, some truth to that. Um, and Berlin himself, if I can just quote, uh, quote the Ignatieff biography. This is on page 168 of the Ignatieff biography. He never doubted that his visit to Russia was the most important event in his life. He came away from Russia with a loathing for Soviet tyranny, which was to inform nearly everything he wrote in defense of Western liberalism and political liberty thereafter. His fierce polemic against historical determinism was animated by what he had learned from her, namely that history could be made to bow before the cheer of from her, namely Akhmatova, could be made to bow before the sheer stubbornness of a human conscience. Uh, I mean, in the poem that I was telling you about, I mean, she wrote this marvelous line. I mean, this is a translation into English. I mean, what it must be like in Russian, I can't imagine. But listen to the power of this, these lines. She's talking, it's a poem called Requiem, and it's a poem about uh, the purges. I mean, just listen to the power of this in English let alone what it must be like in the original. I'd like to name them all by name, but the list has been confiscated and is nowhere to be found. I have woven a wide mantle for them from their meager overheard words. I will remember them always and everywhere. I will never forget them no matter what comes. I mean, the incredible power of those words. I mean, it's an extraordinarily powerful uh, line. Now, okay, so uh, this is... Um, in, in, in a nutshell, Isaiah Berlin, urgently recommends, I mean, of all the biographies we're reading is good, this one truly recommend it, the Ignatieff one, if you want some summer reading. Uh, so we have this phenomenon of a philosopher with um, connections in the corridors of power, and in the immediate period straight after the war, uh, Berlin uh, is, uh, doesn't actually, if you look at what he writes, what he publishes, he doesn't write and publish so much because he was teaching so much. When he got back uh, the British equivalent of the GI Bill, all the so soldiers uh, who were allowed to go to, to the universities, but he wrote a whole series of essays, in particular for foreign affairs, about the Soviet Union and about what the Soviet Union's ideology was and what the Soviet Union represented in the world. Uh, and this was at the behest of uh, the editor of foreign affairs, Hamilton Fish Armstrong. I'm sorry, in my notes, I forgot to mention his final name. I just missed it out when I was typing. As you can see, we've got one of Fish Armstrong's books here, We or They, Two Worlds in Conflict. Uh, and I think, I think it's fair to say that political ideas in the 20th century, uh, which was one of this series of articles about the Soviet Union and about the ideology of uh, communism, what it meant at the time, was, you know, along with George Kennan's famous article on uh, containment, it's probably the most famous article to be published 
in foreign affairs at that time. I mean, if you think about it, it's incredible that that article was published in all places of foreign affairs. Just the first opening section is nearly as long as a typical article in foreign affairs. But it's a genuinely interesting, uh, a genuinely interesting article. Uh, I think one can find reasons for criticism for it, and it's very typical of Berlin's early tap. I mean, he really needed an editor, I have to say. Uh, he, 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 as you probably all noticed, he takes a long time to say anything, and he has an incredible habit of hammering points home and repeating and repeating till you've really got it in seven different ways. But the, 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 the ideas that emerge here are unquestionably extremely important. So Berlin was basically saying there's, there are continuities, but more importantly, there are discontinuities between 19th century political thought and 20th century political thought. And 20th century political thought derives from 19th century political thought, but that doesn't mean that there's a linear uh, path towards 20th century political thought. More to the point, it doesn't mean that totalitarianism in its fascist and communist forms automatically derive from the principal forms of 19th century form. What, what Berlin does subsequent to this, this article, uh, and here we see him looking very serious, which was not his characteristic facial, fe fe facial feature, uh, is uh, develop these ideas during the Cold War. Uh, the ideas that we see at the end of this essay become the essence of the ideas that he develops subsequently in his mature political thought and in the remainder, in particular the 1950s and early 1960s. And I, I, I do personally believe uh, that Berlin, together with John Rawls, are two different ways. They, they rethink contemporary liberalism. Uh, they, they make liberalism relevant for the 20, 20th century. You know, John Rawls, very much a rationalist, Kantian kind of vision of uh, why we ought to have liberal democratic and institutions and a social democratic state, in effect. Berlin, looking at it from a different point of view, uh, from the point of view, well, what, what, what does he argue? He's really following on from the ideas that he develops in this original essay on political ideas in the 20th century. Uh, you know, Subsequently to this publication, Freedom and Its Betrayal is a series of lectures that he gives on British radio, on Radio 4, well, what is, becomes Radio 4, the home channel, where it was an enormous debate because he basically emphasizes even more strongly than he does in this uh, book how there is a tendency in political thought, rationalist political thought, towards totalitarian uh, thinking particularly singles out Rousseau for criticism. Uh, another famous essay, 1951, Hedgehog, Hedgehog and the Fox, uh, you know, introduces the idea that there are some thinkers that uh, know many things, some people who only know one big thing. Uh, Berlin himself, I think it's actually quite interesting. I mean, everybody assumed during his life that he was a characteristic fox. He was somebody who had a million interests and was fascinated by a thousand different things. But at the end of the day, ultimately, he is a hedgehog. He's got somebody who knows one big thing. And I'm going to come on to what that one big thing is in a second. And then the two essays, which really uh, establish him, I think, as one of the most important liberal philosophers of the 20th century. Historical inevitability, which is even more repetitive in some ways than the, the, the essay we wrote, but which is a fantastic argument against any notion of historical determinism, against any idea that we can simply, that there are people who can read the libretto of history, who can decide how we should live on the basis of the fact that they and they alone have the key to unlock the mysteries of history. It's a very, very powerful argument, which leads him into this enormous debate with E.H. Carr, who I've mentioned. It's a brilliant piece of work, which I recommend to you. And then two concepts of liberty, which everybody has, I think, heard of probably here. Uh, the notion that there is positive liberty and negative liberty. And what are the differences? Well, negative liberty is liberty to do as you like uh, without constraint. And uh, whereas uh, positive liberty is the liberty you achieve when you overcome 
your worst nature. Mm -hmm. Live according to your higher self. No? And we both recognize this as a different kind of liberty. No liberty to do what you like is obviously one way of looking at liberty, but liberty also to make something of yourself is also a form of liberty. Now, Berlin basically argues that in political terms, the trouble with positive liberty is that it, as a doctrine, it too often becomes uh, taken over by people who know what the people want and, and how they should live, no? And this is the, the essence of his argument. But also included in the essay about two concepts of liberty, is an idea which he subsequently developed in the remainder, remainder of his career as a thinker. Uh, and it's a famous phrase, which I'm going to read out. Everything is what it is. Liberty is liberty, not equality or fairness or justice or culture or human happiness or a quiet conscience. If the liberty of myself or my class or nation depends on the misery of a number of other human beings, the system which promotes this is unjust and immoral. But if I curtail or lose my freedom in order to lessen the shame uh, of such inequality and do not myself materially increase the individual liberty of others, an absolute liberty takes place. Yet it remains uh, true that the freedom of some must at times be curtailed to secure the freedom of others. Upon what principle should this be done? If freedom is a sacred, untouchable value, there can be no such principle. Mm -hmm. Rather, of these conflicting rules or principles must at any rate in practice yield, not always for reasons which must be clearly stated, let alone generalized into rules of universal maxims. Sorry, I, I, that's a long quotation. I, I didn't do a very good job of bringing it down. But he basically argues, and I think it's crucial uh, it develops the point in the last section of, of the essay we've been reading uh, of the need for pluralism. And, 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 and I think you can see it in terms of the Cold War West. There are going to be some societies like the United States, which put an enormous premium on individual liberty, understood in the negative sense. No state, minimum of controls, right? There are going to be others, all this from Norway, in which you have a society which puts a big emphasis on social security and welfare. You're going to have other societies that have different premiums. The, 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 there, are, there is an enormous, rich diversity possible in human societies, and there always will be if you permit it. And you should allow societies to negotiate their own compromise between the different, uh, the different values uh, and not necessarily assume that there is one model which must be applicable everywhere. But the crucial thing is that you should allow people to try democratically to work out uh, what their particular society's compromise will be, how much freedom they will have, how much equality, how much... And you ought to be able to recognize that different societies have different principles and different hierarchies of values. And you ought to be able to, too, to say that societies that deny such values are the enemy. It's uh, quite an elaborate justification for the very heterogeneous Cold War co coalition, but it's not the less valuable, I think, for that reason. And sorry if I've talk far too much today. But Berlin, I think, brings the course to an end. I mean, the course ultimately, I think, and I hope you agree with that, has been about contrasting total ideas, totalizing ideas, contrasting uh, uh, I'm quite tired, actually, uh, contrasting um, attempts to enforce uniformity Ultimately, all our thinkers are very conscious of this fact that uniformity imposed from above is deadly and there is an enormous need of both uh, political tolerance and diversity to counteract it.